Thank you so much, and I'm very impressed. Uh, I've been waiting years to say this. It's, it was awe-inspiring. Um, I'm not going to do a summary. I'm not going to do a precy uh, because of the time. We started um, a little bit late. Uh, but Susan, uh, very impressed with your uh, uh, presentation. But is there any efficacy when it comes to its application with uh, individuals who have a major mental uh, or major mental illness, in particular depression? As you know, uh, anhedonia, which is a psychological and uh, neurochemical component of where depressed people don't have pleasure uh, or don't have the ability to feel pleasure and um, how do you reach those people and has, have you studied that? Thank you, Peter. Um, I have not studied that specifically and Emiliana might know a bit more about that, but what I can say is that awe, uh, like positive emotions, works in uh, what Barbara Fredrickson calls the broaden and build model. So when we experience awe, it's kind of uh, the, the exact opposite as when we experience a, a, you know, a negative emotion like terror. So if we feel terror, a bear is running at us in the woods and we are trying to like survive, our scope really narrows, right? We're just looking at how do we get out of these woods and get away from this bear. Positive emotions kind of work the opposite way. So instead of narrowing our scope, they actually widen it. So they make us kind of see more, uh, appreciate more in our environment. And as a result, we can acquire additional resources. So we might think of um, different ways that we could do something or solve a problem. Oh, shoot, I can't get to work this way. But you know what? I remember my friend saying I could go this way. And if you're maybe in a positive emotion state, you might be thinking about that other way you could get to work. Uh, scientists, uh, uh, researchers have given people who feel positive emotions puzzles, for example, and the ones that are, are given positive emotions beforehand, not given, but are made to feel positive emotions beforehand, solve the puzzles more creatively, faster, with different types of solutions. So in terms of Oz's direct relationship to depression and anxiety, again, Emiliana might know a little bit more about that than me, but I can say from a general standpoint of positive emotions, part of the reason that they can be such great buffers for things like depression and anxiety is the way that they open our minds and make people feel like they have access to more solutions, feel a little less desperate, a little less lack of hope. There are more possibilities than they thought. Emiliana, I don't know if you'd like to add to that. Yeah. Oh, you did such a beautiful job, Susan, summarizing that, um, that, that response. The only thing I would add is a nuance that awe is really about shifting from a self-focused inner narrative, from thinking about one's own potential string of threats uh, or um, difficulties in the past, present, or future, and... Um, adopting a perspective that's focused on the world around you, what's happening outside of you. Um, and that is just a more, um, that, that kind of perspective allows for positive emotional experiences in a way that um, self-focus just doesn't. And, and particularly in the context of people who struggle with mood disorders, right? That there's this tendency to, to perseverate on threat and harm and grief and the unpleasant emotions in a very self-focused way and also in a very static way. And awe, as you've heard throughout various presentations, it's really about flexibility, things being dynamic, things changing, you being part of something that's changing over the course of time and the you know broad expanse of the universe. So I would never, say, hey, if somebody's got a major psychological illness, they should use awe as their treatment. That, that, that's not even remotely advisable. But as a supplement, as an additional thing, if you're friends with somebody, you're not a clinical expert, but you're friends with somebody you know is going through a difficult time, I would recommend taking them out to somewhere beautiful and expansive and just sharing that kind of experience that is in, in, it is conducive of awe with them as a as an effort to be to be supportive. Well, thanks both of you. I mean, as as a psychiatrist who deals with emotional disturbance, and um, by admission, I'm an operational forensic psychiatrist with the police, but I still see patients. I use concepts like awe as an adjunct 
to treating people who have um, a major depression, uh, sometimes under the guise of mindfulness. It depends on, on, on different aspects, but it's all related. Jeff, do you have comments? Um, yeah, I guess, um, and I'm trying to multitask here too. And from what I was gathering, I think you guys covered it really well. One thing that I emphasize, any of the work that I do, right? So I'm, I'm a doctor, but not a doctor. I don't see patients or anything like that. I'm a researcher and a scientist. So from that perspective, and what I've learned from others is these practices and resilience or in awe are definitely helpful, but I am also a very, very clear, like Emily, Anna, you say, I'm, let me say, to, do not misinterpret this as saying it's there to replace medication if that's necessary in psychotherapy, no way. And to be very clear with that, stuff like this can help you if you're seeing a therapist and there's nothing wrong with that because that's true resilience. If you need more help than you can give to yourself, that's strength, that's real resilience. However, like Emily Ann and Susan said as well, this is the stuff that can help you when you're outside the therapy room or the therapist's office, the stuff that you're doing. And especially for those here and like John, the great work you do at Fordham as well, it's that idea of ways that you can help your mate, your partner, your coworker, your family member um, to help them work through things in one day at a time of, and this is the last thing I will say is it's not just doing it it's known why we're doing these things. And that's really how we get these habits to stick and to become part of our lifestyles. And just to add, it's important for us as caregivers to also practice it. 